Good afternoon, everyone. And uh, it's really my honor to be here. And uh, thank you for Professor Harris and Lolita and uh, make me th this link connected with the Richard. Thank you for inv inviting me here. Well, for the past uh, like uh, 18 years, I've been working in China for a few growing companies doing business in China. So today I'm trying to come over here, talk about the, my perspective view of the business landscape in China. And uh, I will, my, my hope, my goal is that they'll give you more the inside story about how to run a business environment and uh, that sort, sort of thing, based on the practical, pra practical reasons since I've been there for many years. And uh, so I will start off to talk a little bit, introduce myself a little bit. Uh, actually, I came to United States in 1986. At that time, I applied for graduate school. Basically, I, I studied in physics. I got my uh, PhD in physics from Montana State University. I don't know how many of you heard about that. And then after that, I worked in quite a few universities, like uh, Wisconsin, Pittsburgh, for years. Then I decided not to stay in the academic field anymore, so I kind of started up a little business. So I started from 1997 to 2002. I started up a couple of companies in the U.S., in Urbana, Champaign, Illinois, where I used to live. And then I had a partnership with one of my uh, friends who is from uh, MIT, we co-founded the company called Boston Instrument. For that company, we majored into the medical equipment, and the name is the MRI, and applying uh, some local hospitals. Uh, from 2002 to 2007, I kind of decided to go back to China to looking for some opportunities there. So we set up a subsidiary company of the Boston Instrument, we call Shanghai Boston Instrument. And we research and develop those medical equipment and the major market that were used in mainland China. Uh, during that time, I also started up a company called eHow, and they're trying to do some business like for smart home integration type of the product. Well, that was the time I, for, I spent about five years and uh, to start some company. The 2007 and the 2013, I pretty much have done a lot of the working. The reason for, uh, for some local private company in China. The reason for that is the, our SBI got acquired by one of the company named ENN, which is the large private company in China. And what they do is to do the gas distribution for quite a few cities. So they are a big company, and they're in energy sectors. We joined the ENN, then we did a quite a few projects. That gave me a, a lot of experience how to do business globally. So first thing I did is that for one project, is called coal underground coal gasification. Uh, which means to burn the gas underground and get the gas out of the earth then used for uh, infrastructure reasons. So that project on site was in Inner Mongolia of in China, which is quite cold areas there. I spent about a year to work on that project. Later, we acquired a company from uh, Uzbekistan, which is the Middle East area. So I work as the board director there for about a year and uh, get some different experience about the, those regions. And the later on, the, we start a very huge project, what we call EN Solar. EN Solar is that uh, we use some uh, high technology, we call flat panel manufacturer technology to utilize that for the solar panels for photovoltaic. And uh, we partnership with the Applied Material, which is the Silicon Valley company. And they provide us with equipment. We build up the manufacture facility and the uh, research back in China. For that entity, we didn't have the right time because right after we started production, 
then financial crisis started. So with investment over, let's say about 200 million uh, US dollars for that project, and it uh, didn't turn out to have any result. So later on I said, what I can do about that? So I went to the Europe, because at that time, that's a marketplace. So we start up the company we call Yen and <coughs> Europe, and uh, we're trying to build a power plant. So that's really shifted me from <laughs> manufacturer into the application, from the technology into, the, uh, into like a utility company type of the business. So I did about one, uh, 10 megawatts of the power plant in Germany and also in Italy. And uh, later on, well, I was uh, headhunted by one of the company called GCL. I think uh, GCL is the largest uh, silicon company and they provide silicon material for the photovoltaic applications. One of your, sp I, I think one of my colleagues used to come to this class to talk about the uh, uh, renewable energy sections. I work as the VP for technology development. Basically just give the roadmap about uh, how the uh, solar business can grow in and what kind of application we can implement it. So later the start of the business is called LED and they invest quite a lot of money and uh, which is in Suzhou and uh, is near Shanghai. And that project only lasted about a year. So, uh, but I learned a lot of the experience about how to make a connections between different uh, sections of that, that industry. So pretty much that, that time is that I did uh, quite a few of those the business practice in some big companies. Later on, <coughs> during that time, we also co-found, my personally, I co-founded a company uh, with my brother and that company was co-founded in 1997. So during that time, in 2009, we moved the company from Champagne to Shenzhen. The company is called Zemodo. So we found that company there. In 2012, I said, this business is growing pretty big. So I come back to this business. I kind of in charge of the business development and the technology management and also in charge of the finance and the uh, raise some money and the IPO, that sort of things. During this uh, past uh, six years, I really did a lot of the uh, entrepreneur startup works. For example, yeah, I set up the, our Jiangsu facility, which is the quite a big facility. We got a piece of land and built our manufacturers, and uh, that took us about uh, one year to get that finished. Another thing is that we set up an R&D center in Bay Area, in Fremont, and which doing the R&D and the operations. Also, we set up the back to Europe and they did the sales subsidiaries, and Australia too. So anyway, look at my background, it seems cover quite a lot of things. And the good thing is that I really accumulated some of the business, business experience. But the bad thing is that uh, my English is getting not as good as it used to be. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm just uh, trying to speak slowly and uh, trying to make myself understood. And I also was a very informal talker. So if you have uh, some questions during my presentation, just stop me. We can go from there. This is uh, basically my personal background. Then I'm going to do a little bit of commercial slides about what my current company, which I co-founded. And the company called the Modem and the Mishir. Basically, we have a two business identity. One is called the Modem, one is called Mishir. And what we do is that we make all kinds of devices used for home. In home application, like surveillance, like smart living, like energy management, and uh, that kind of application. So we produce a variety of the devices. And the, all those devices are connected into a, a cloud. So the new business is called IoT platform. So in 2012, we start to develop the 
platform ourselves, we call Mishia. And that platform is pretty much serve all of the devices we connected. And the little profile about our company, we have a, currently have about uh, 650 employees. And uh, last year, our revenue, I think, is about uh, 95 million US dollars. So we kind of growing like very pretty fast. It's about 60% uh, per year. Uh, up to today, I think we have about 4.5 million devices, which uh, most of them are manufactured by us and are connected. And uh, we have about uh, 1.5 million customers. Uh, majority of the customers in US. Uh, also, we have uh, our devices, since we sell globally, we have covered about uh, 40 countries. Uh, last year, we built up IDC Center in Champaign, Illinois, and uh, that's a huge capacity. So all of our data are installed in our own IDC centers. The product we have produced is the pretty much uh, from like a video uh, camera, and they used in different locations, indoor, outdoor, front door, and uh, currently we see a lot, uh, a lot of the one of the product we call doorbell, smart doorbell, which will identify who coming to your house, and the second category of our product is like a smart living product. Like uh, you have your backyard irrigation systems, uh, which will automatically manage your uh, backyard, like a grass when you're open watering. Also, we have a third category, what we call is the uh, energy meter, which is the thermostat. And also, we, we produce one of the core smart vending, which will automatically sensor whether there's people live there, how to turn that off, where close the vending, and to save some energy bill. Every devices pretty much have um, different sensors are connected. All the analytical work and the application work uh, has been done in the cloud. So this is our major business model. For the platform, <coughs> which we spend about, yes. you have the idea to start Zomoto after you were working you know, in manufacturing and then you were doing something in energy. So how did you choose to start? Okay, uh, this is, since our general, it's a very good question actually I'm going to talk about in the last uh, section is why I want to do business. That's how to drive, it's like a, the purpose of a running business. The answer is that I want to build up the brand name companies, so anyway. This is our platform. Our platform, we start to research and develop it in from uh, 2012. This plat platform is very open, and uh, pretty much any devices that you home use can be connected is through the cloud. Your appliance, your refrigerators, or some other stuff, you can connect it. And uh, so connectivity is very important. And then we want every device has its own applications. So we, based on what's environment and experience, and we do sort of the, uh, like a security surveillance, we automatically know who will come to your house, whether there's some alarm you need to be pay attention to. And uh, in the center part of this platform, we have a lot of the like, AI-initiated cloud technology built it in. So that will automatically sensor all locations. The current application actually only used in these two fields. It's like security and the smart home. For user side, since our APP platform is very open, pretty much any user can use it. Developer can develop their own APPs. Also, you can generate a lot of the business through this kind of openness. And uh, you probably know that uh, currently, like uh, Google and Amazon, are pretty much getting into this industry. Uh, this is our data center in Champaign. We have about the one, one thousand uh, pick by, uh, 100 pickbytes of capacities. And uh, currently, we have 1.5 million customer. 
And for this capacity, it can serve about the 2.5 million customers. So we plan ahead a little bit. Anyway, that's a little bit about commercial about our company. Uh, actually, today here, really, I want to share some perspective view from my personal experience on the ground in Shenzhen and uh, some part of other part of the China. Uh, I think I look at the website of this class. There was a presentation given by Chris Berry. I went through this, his presentation. He used the three term, which I think uh, really fit into what I want to talk about. Just so everybody knows, that was last spring. <laughs> yeah. But it's up there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I'm trying to uh, sense that, what kind of the class I should get. I like the word they use for climate and the soil and the nutrients. And uh, I, then I'm going to, in today's talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about what's climate business climate in Shenzhen and other city. And then I will talk about what's the soil. And the major thing I focused on what's the nutrients, because this define, you can have a variety of the definitions, what's the good for your, uh, for startups. I will end up with some suggestions, then we get into Q&A. Anyway, uh, I don't know how many of you heard about the word called China Bay Area, uh, which is the proposed about a couple of years ago. Uh, what the Chinese government is trying to build up an economical zone that will compete with the, some current big rooms. So currently we have a Tokyo, we have a San Francisco Bay Area, have a New York, and those are some demographic data about those regions. So in China, they proposed the, this zone, which covered about the one-fifth one of the Guangdong province, and what they call Guangdong, Hong Kong, and Macau Bay Area, which covered about the 56, uh, uh, 56,000 square kilometer, which is quite big, and also has 1.3 trillion GDPs which is very small compared to some other uh, Bay Area regions. But the population is quite big and has about the 66 million people there. You know, Shenzhen is right in the center of this new Bay Area. Something that's very interesting is that, uh, you know, Shenzhen is the city. Uh, this is some comparison between these two, uh, these four Bay Area data, like a GDP per capita, New York seems ahead, and uh, then San Francisco and Tokyo, and uh, the, this Bay Area is only a different fraction of that, but they are growing very fast. Uh, something about the Shenzhen, this city, I know a lot of students from Shenzhen uh, in Stanford, and uh, I can point out some numbers, and the one number is called most startups in China. So if you want to really to do startups, I think Shenzhen is the first one to attract the people to do startups. The reason, I will talk later. And the second one, the Shenzhen, in, for past 10 years, still the youngest city in China. The average age is like 33 years old, so very young. And the other part of the China has the kind of overaged problems, but Shenzhen still has its uh, principal, the young people work there. Of course, GDP is the highest in, in China, if you talk about your city. And the growing rate here for about 30,000 per capita actually is growing about 27% over previous year. It's very fast. Two things I want to emphasize is about patent. The patent application in China, I think a uh, Shenzhen covered about the total of 14%, and uh, which is more than any other cities. If we look at it by cities, it's the highest one. That tells us is that uh, if you are running the high technology, actually Shenzhen has a good climate and soil and the nutrient. That's why 
has the most of the uh, pattern applied. The second part is called PTC pattern applications, which tells us that this is also covered about 41% of the nationwide. That tells me is that uh, Shenzhen is trying to be doing the globalization process. So really their product are shipped all over the world and uh, that's give, me some, give, give us some hint about that. And uh, now let's get into the climate. How many new startups every day in Shenzhen? I didn't know this. You know, I've been working in Shenzhen through different, different uh, level of the, uh, I was in some kind of advi advisory board for some like a city and some industry. And I didn't realize that many startups. You know, in 2017, there's about half a million of startups registered in Shenzhen. And uh, every day, they register over like 15,000 new startups. So if I convert that into per 1,000 populations, this accumulated. Now we have uh, 87 incorporated companies among 1,000 populations. And we have 266 other business entities, open restaurants, coffee shop, and uh, everything. So that's a huge number. Also, there's one high-tech license entity. Uh, this is a very important one, because if you are granted by government as the high technology cert certified company, you take a, a lot of advantage to get the government subsidies. I will talk about that later. Also, total IPO in Shenzhen is the 389. And the last year alone has about 160. So if you talk about this couple of years, and the Shenzhen really convert from those OEM hub for hardware into more innovative cities. This is the overall climate. Uh, soil. Since I kind of live in Bay Area for quite many years, so I know this is the world-class place. This is a place that everybody dreamed to. And uh, there's a variety of the startups in Bay Area. Has the most advanced, advanced investment mechanism. If you can easily find angel, you can easily find the, some VCs. So fund is very available here. Also, the most important is that they have a world-class talent here. You know, I graduated from Tsinghua University back in China many years ago. And uh, we have a core Tsinghua alumni here or something. We have about uh, 3,000 student alumni here, 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 here Bay in Bay Area, which attracted, uh, I think, uh, some other countries, I think, is the same. So most advanced. Uh, especially te technical talent are attracted into Bay Area. So that's a huge advantage in this part here. And also, I, I talk a little bit about Khan. I trying to find what's, <laughs> what's not good for startups. I, I remember about three years ago, when our solar company had a subsidiary here, we were trying to develop one product called uh, micro in uh, convert, in uh, inverter. Then we come up with design and uh, get all layout work. And the, the boss back in China wants us done that in, in three months to get that into our applications. We look all over the places trying to do that. And they didn't find any company. The shortest time they proposed to us is like three months. So that's something really lack of the hardware engineering especially for electronics industry, which will take a much uh, faster, faster pace. So also has the cost of living, I'm not going to talk about. And the Shenzhen, from my experience that uh, I think they really, uh, some old mindset talk about Shenzhen impression, it's like a copycat. It's like a, in Chinese word called sanzai. 
is that you can find any chips, any product in Huachan market, pretty much everything. But for past few years, I witnessed a lot of change from those like OEM oriented uh, manufacture into the core hardware innovations. And uh, this really is as a kind of ecosystems which can let the people to produce that uh, very simple, very easily. So that's why I convert that into the like world class hardware manufacturer ecosystems. Uh, I read some paper about, so for electronics uh, section here, uh, 50, less than 50, very close to 50% of the product are more or less related to Shenzhen. Either designed it or uh, developed by some company in Shenzhen or manufactured there. So they call Shenzhen the capital of uh, electronics hardware. And uh, for past two years, I think uh, Shenzhen trying to convert from hardware to software part. So a lot of software startup has a very good soil. You can take a lot of advantage. Uh, from my company, actually, when we first uh, set up a research center, uh, one we, our research has two sections. One is called hardware design, another one is called software and uh, platform design. So we couldn't do that in Shenzhen. That was the 2012. So we set up office in Beijing, and uh, because the all the talented people are in Beijing are in software development engineers, uh, up to last year, we gradually transfer our Beijing operation into Shenzhen unit, and we shrink down a little bit about Beijing operations. The reason for that is just the more, make more business sense. Another part of that is we can get uh, some talent people are uh, willing to move from Beijing to Shenzhen. So this has uh, some advantage if you are in software startups, Shenzhen is getting there. Not quite yet, it's not, but it has a, a lot of advantage. About the cons about the Shenzhen, I think innovation is still somewhere still lacking, especially in the people's mind. For example, if we have uh, some old engineers, like over 30 years old, if you give him some task, want to do some development, in their mind, they're always trying to memorize what they have done before. So pretty much want to copy everything from what their experience from other competitors. That mindset is still there. So if you want to convert that into more innovative work, you have to hire some young guys. They don't know anything about the history. They do much better than some old people's. And uh, also, Shenzhen still lack of the global legal guarantees. I, I'm going to talk about that later. <laughs> and uh, university is one of the shortest things they don't have. They only have one uh, Shenzhen University. And uh, I think they only have one alumni, very famous one, is the founder of the Tencent. So the publicity is there, but actually talent is still not enough. Besides those Shenzhen and the Silicon Valley comparison, I think uh, in Shenzhen, if you are doing some like a hardware innovation or some marketing in China, that, that's, that's a good place to start. In addition to that, and that I th I th give some numbers here, I think Shenzhen is one of the top number one city in China to attract the foreign high-tech company in China. Uh, one example is that uh, you know, my wife uh, didn't have much to do, so she stayed in Shenzhen and joined one group. It's called uh, SWIC. It's called Shenzhen Women International Club. I didn't realize that club has been there for over 25 years. And uh, currently, they have about 500 members. I just got some number <laughs> from her, is that they represent about 100 89 country and agents. That means a lot of wives uh, live there, they enjoy it. 
And the same, they have the longest time they stay there was like 30 years now. And the, some of those people, I give you another second example, our neighbor. Our neighbor is from uh, Brazil. And uh, 20 years ago, he went to China, work as a procurement department for Carry 4. And uh, he said about those things, he ended up quit his job and start a company and doing business, doing imports beer and wines from, uh, from uh, Europe. Uh, he's been doing that for 20 years now. He has uh, two kids, which looks not like Chinese, but speak frequently Cantonese and uh, Chinese. So that tells us that a lot of the foreign high-tech companies are used to Shenzhen as a hub. And last Christmas, and uh, uh, last Thanksgiving dinner, I stayed at in Shenzhen. I was invited to one of the uh, friends who is the director of uh, Apple operation, which is in Shenzhen. They have over, I think I talked to the people, and they said that in Shenzhen they have Apple, they have two units of Apple operation. One is R&D, one is operation. And the Google R&D Center also set up the institute there too. So they track a lot of the foreign high tech company. And the secondly, a lot of big company in China, if they want to change their headquarter or set up their subsidiaries, and they choose Shenzhen as their number one choice. Every year, I, th I think they rank, rank uh, quite, a, quite a few companies or ship or moved to Shenzhen. Talk about infrastructure, I think they have a pretty good uh, uh, high technology readiness, like internet, uh, penetration everywhere, and uh, broadband speed actually is very reasonable, compatible with here. Uh, they have a, like a, we talk about they have a mobile pay, a lot of advanced stuff. So this is the overall about soil in Shenzhen. Yes. So even though you don't have a world-class university, do you think that is likely to change uh, soon? Particularly as uh, large companies are coming in and doing a lot of R&D and, and so on. So I'm going to talk about that later in oh, the new chain okay. about the human capital. Oh, okay. Why? There's no university, still a lot of talent pool. So, now I get into the new chain. Uh, to define what's a good new chain for the startups, actually, Chris used a lot of the different aspects. What I'm majorly talking about, access to finance and the human capital and the, some resources. And uh, you know, in Shenzhen, I often heard my, some of the students or friends who want to do startup in China, they always ask, how I be able to get money? And uh, easy to get money or hard to get money or you have to use their own money. I have one friend who live here, startup company in Shenzhen, he run out all his money, he sold his house here, <laughs> and there's still not enough money. Actually, if you explore more about the Shenzhen, there's a lot of the access, but has to be very careful. Uh, for, uh, I'll give some example about that when our company, how we do the uh, fundraising, how to get the equity investment. One thing I want to say is that the in Shenzhen, a really lack of the like angel fund and the VC fund. It's pretty much VC fund just behavior like they say, I'm, I can do any investment, any startup, I will put money there. Actually, I, that's not true. Uh, a lot of funds are very like short term. They have very restricted term and conditions. And uh, if I notice that there's a quite a few company uh, funded by some engineering, they didn't know much about uh, about how to run business. Ended up the uh, VC took their business <laughs> and uh, end up to sell to someone. So that's a very restricted term and condition. As a startup, we should be very careful about that. Also, every year, like a nine million US, US dollars are invested 
you send them startups, that's quite a lot. So pretty much you can, if you are in those connections or networks, it's, it's very simple to find the money. But it depends on what industry you are in, what business you are running. Um, here is the last year's data about what mon where most the money go. And the majorly, if you have some technology oriented, and you have like a health and medi Medicare, you can put quite a lot of money there. And the hardware used to be like a product used to be easy to find to get an investment investor. And uh, this last year, uh, compared to uh, 2016 data, and this one dropped dramatically, used to be high. If you have a product idea, you can easily to get an investor to invest in your uh, business. But now, all the investors go into the different field. But in summary, and I think there's enough venture capital to support a startup in Shenzhen. I'm going to give an example of, the, of what the modem has, has achieved. Beside all of those investors, and uh, there's another advantage you should take, especially for high technology startups. You know, in China, there's always government oriented, a lot of the like industry, like uh, so in Shenzhen, the government issue a lot of policy as a startup to anything you really can apply. I have a one friend who actually one friend's daughter, she moved from Shanghai to Shenzhen and she applying a lot of benefit from there. End up she start up uh, her own business very easily. For example, it's like office rental space. It's not much requirement. It's just that if you're just start up, you can apply that for the first uh, three years, they can give you like 80% uh, of the reimbursement. So this thing is something you have to, you should uh, do some research and uh, take advantage of those sub subsidy, uh, subsidy programs. Uh, the modem has been in Shenzhen for seven years. For first two years, we didn't really know anything about the government incentives and uh, like uh, fund investment until 2015. In other words, before 2015, we all used our own money. <laughs> we didn't use the investor's money to, to build up the structure. And, uh, but uh, since we have a size of the business, we have uh, uh, some business uh, numbers, so we attract a lot of investors. So in very short time, we did about three rounds of the uh, PE investment. We total raised about uh, 85 million US dollar in three rounds through private equities. And uh, that, that one I want to emphasize two things. First thing is that uh, for any PE fund, there are very restricted term and conditions. So if your business plan, you don't have you, you propose you have some business goals to achieve. If you're not, they're really trying to beat you up and uh, give very strict terms. So as a startup, you be very careful about the number, about the agreement with the investors, and uh, don't hurt yourself by over expect your growth of your business. They are serious. <laughs> the second one is the I've, I will reflect back to the slides. I said Shenzhen lack of the legal guarantees. And uh, there's one story about the, you know, in, in, in US or in some other part of the world, when you do talk about investor, that's really serious things, right? You talk several times and negotiation, term machines, go through this process. It's end up you sign an agreement. Once you sign, you feel, oh, good, I'm rich now. <laughs> but in China, you have to be very careful with that. The, even though you signed your agreement, but the money is not injected, you're not, still not sure yet. And the, one of the investors used to uh, try to invest me, and he signed a contract with me. 
for about uh, 20, uh, about five million U.S. dollar. And end up the, his fund has some problem later, and there's no like a, like a payback or anything. You just say, "Sorry, you can't do it." So as a startup, my advice is that if money is not deposited into a bank, you still have to work on that. <laughs> and uh, it's not 100% sure. Because the legal things, you can go through this legal lawsuit against them, and that will take a lot of time, and you will suffer from those process. So that's my suggestion. Rick, can I uh, ask? Sure. So the private equity, mm. you had to sell some of the stock in the company to these people to yes. the private equity. That's right. But it was not a buyout, right? I mean, no, the, it's not. The main uh, ownership of the company, is it a public company now? No, 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 it's not yet. It's still a private company. Yeah, yeah still a private company. Okay. And their, their wish, they expect in this company can be IPO, so they have uh -huh. exit plan, so they can make a fortunes out of that. Okay, right. And especially a couple of years ago in China, what they call PE, they're performing very well because there are a lot of IPOs and there are a lot of acquisitions. Is it mostly Chinese investors? Or Actually, it it's very inter international. It's okay. very international. And uh, I know when we have an investor, we have an investor from the US, and they have sort of parent fund, like a US dollar fund, the RMB fund, and the one project that can be both. Uh, a lot of mechanism advanced ones. So. So kind of as a follow-up to that, or a follow-back to that, you were talking about the availability of financing in Shenzhen. So, okay, the venture capital is available if you need it. Are most of the companies located in Shanghai and Beijing, and they just come and do the deals in Shenzhen, or do you actually have the You mean fund is from Shanghai and Beijing, and right. find a business or, or in Shenzhen. Are the companies that are doing VC, have they opened up offices in Shenzhen? If it's a big fund, they have a lot of the core Shenzhen office. Okay. They start from the team, the core project team. Yeah. You start to do due diligence and the business plan sort of thing. Okay. Then they get into the headquarter. OK. Yeah, yeah thank you. Mm. Second part I'm going to talk about is debt loans, which is the really good resource you can use. Because for equity investment, you really dilute your share very easily. And but loan from a bank is I used to work in the you know in the Europe. When I work in the Europe and my partner has a relationship with their bank for three generations to support their family business. It's a very strong relationship. But in China, the bank is really treat you like a, uh, you have to have some sort of the personal guarantee or fixed asset to be able to apply for that. Or you can use the government as the collateral to if you have issued some high tech certificate or you have a pre-IPO, use your IPO share as a collateral to get a, be able to get the bank loans. So it's not easy to get. But as soon as you got it, that's, that's good money. So for past uh, like uh, three years, we've been working through different banks, talking about our, what our business model and that sort of thing. We end up to get about 15 million department, uh, debt loans from the bank, which is not really easy to get. But a lot of addition to do that, uh, contribute to that is we build up our manufacture facility. In other words, we purchase the land, build the facility, be able to use that as an as asset to uh, collateralize the, those loans. So that part, if you can get it, that's a good thing. Another thing I want to mention is that the, the bank loan. The bank loan is the, you know, they have like a two year, three year, when, as a CFO of the company, when you do budgetary work for your business plan, you've got to be very, very careful. We, are, we suffer quite a lot from there. You know, Chinese money are manipulated by the government. The government sometimes depends on the overall uh, climate. They 
restricted than some of the loans. Even though you get approved, but for that month, you don't have, they don't have money. They don't have a budget for that. So you won't be able to get a loan released to your account. And then normally that was much later than, later than what they promised to you. We have one very terrible experience, is that we built up the Yenchen manufacturer facility. We have about 10 million, uh, yeah, about 10, uh, actually, we are less than 10 million, about 8 million loans from the bank, which is due like uh, next month. Then CFO is trying to get money and the payback and that sort of thing. They said it only take one week you get it renewed for next year. I say, for, okay, let's plan for three weeks. So we return the money back to the bank. End up, we didn't get the money until about a month and a half later. So for that month, that's the first time we delayed to pay our <laughs> salary, which we, we feel ashamed about that. So from that time, so whenever we do our budget, we really have got to be very careful about the Chinese yeah, bank. One of the things that every entrepreneur I've ever talked to has told me, their biggest worry is being able to pay salary, right? If, if, if you get stuck with a cash flow problem like that, it's an absolutely terrible thing. Especially when you're in growing phase. Yeah, right. So that's some advice I could give you later. Anyway, we take some advantage of the government subsidy. And so every year, we we'll probably be able to apply for about one million US dollar from a government subs subsidies. And the very important one is what we call here, this one, what we call state level high tech cer certified. And this one is that uh, if you're in the business for three years, you are involved in some industry, which is the government, they have their list, and they, you did your performance work, you're applying for that. Immediately, as soon as you got that license, you get 10% of the tax deduction, which is a huge number for the size of our company. So this is the very important one. This is overall the financial uh, financing in Shenzhen, I think is uh, pretty good. Okay, now I get into the second part of the new chain about the human capital. This is some data, some numbers, demographic data about Shenzhen, population, average age, uh, migrates. That's something I want to emphasize. You know, GDP, Shenzhen from uh, tw uh, 2016 to 2017, I compare that data with Shanghai, Beijing, and Hong Kong. And uh, the largest growing rate is in Shenzhen. 22% from uh, 26 data to 27 data. So this is the, some numbers. Another number, which is the advantage in Shenzhen, is how to get the human capitals. So in Shenzhen, even though there's 11 million populations, and every year the numbers are increased, but increased by some meaning of the requirement how to fit into that uh, Shenzhen residence uh, license. So in last, in last year, there were about a half million migrants moving to Shenzhen because of those quality of life. I didn't talk about that, how good the air condition air is. And there are also government subsidy, which really attracts some people, especially high educated people. And also, there's a, huge, a lot of big companies in Shenzhen, like Tencent, Huawei, the headquarters in Shenzhen. They, hire, they have a lot of positions available. So pretty much that attracts a lot of people from Beijing, from Shanghai, from all of the uh, countries. That, you know, for this about half meaning every year, those requirements to, get, to be able to work in Shenzhen or get a Shenzhen benefit, is that you have a high education. You have good housing now, so there's a lot of housing being built. A lot of housing. To accommodate the people coming in. Yes, a lot of housing, 
But there's a, another problem to go with that is the pricing, just like the Silicon value here. It's the highest here, this number, housing price. If you look at the couple years number, Shenzhen is cheaper than Beijing and Shanghai. Now it's the most expensive housing in China, not compared to Hong Kong. <laughs> so that's a kind of the bad side of the attract the talent people come to work in Shenzhen. And the, 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 so that's why government is trying to give the subsidy, subsidy to reimburse on some of the rental. Is that at the municipal level, at the provincial level, or who? who? Um, city level. The city yeah. that builds the housing. That's right. Okay. For example, if you have a master degree, you, can apply, you get more points. You apply either for subsidy for your rent, mm -hmm. or you, if you have money, you can buy the house with the, some reimbursement to you. So that attributed, contributed to this half million talent people moved from Beijing to Shenzhen, uh, from other city to Shenzhen. In my company, we used to have about 60 uh, software engineers. We, just one year, we moved in about uh, 20 of them. They actually had located from Beijing into Shenzhen. So, so Rick, um, you say that the pros is that the quality of life is good. What makes the quality of life in Shenzhen good? Okay, three things. Uh, air, okay. very important. Yeah, I noticed the pollution is a lot less than it is in Shanghai yeah. and Beijing. The, you know, they have about 300 days of the clean skies compared to like 100, less than 100 days in Beijing. And uh, the uh, food, it's, a, it's like an immigrant city. It's all kind of food and not expensive. Another thing is a lot of activities, especially for the high educated people. They have a, they organized a lot of the like uh, club associations, and uh, so people really from all over the world they, they feel like like a home. Well, that's another big thing. Is their slogan? Is as soon as you arrive in Shenzhen, you are Shenzhenese. You feel like you're not uh, at, have to adopt the, the culture and that sort of thing. What about the quality of schools for children? Uh, two bad things. School is improving every year, improve quite a bit. Another one, which is not considered uh, as the good improvement, is the hospital. Hospital is something a little bit of the high level hospital is not uh, enough to support that kind of new environment. So that's uh, one reason. But school, uh, they've been attracted a lot of good school from uh, Beijing to open up the school in Shenzhen. So every residential area, they build one. The, all, the house price will go with that. <laughs> if you have a good school district, and the house price increase quite a bit. Yeah. Yes. Two migrants, one has family, one doesn't. Will there be a preference to take the one that does not have a household coming to Shenzhen? Uh, Regulation-wise, I, I don't think there's a difference. Okay. But a lot of the not married and young people are moving there. I don't think there's any sub subsidy for the children move, moving or something. But is there accommodation or if you're coming from another city in China, Tier 3 city, for instance, or a mm -hmm. rural area, do you have to abandon your family if you have the skills, or will they accommodate bringing the family over? Yeah, bring the, actually, family is uh, some sort of the motivation to drive those talent to move there to Shenzhen because of the quality of their life. And uh, at the same time, they also attract some elderly people to move into Shenzhen, which is some rich people from the northern part of China, because the weather, the air, so they really, those older people are moving to Shenzhen as well. And uh, for, for a lot of programs for different ages, but uh, it seems Shenzhen are not 
really take some action to welcome the elderly people <laughs> come this time. Yeah, here I actually put here, the rising cost of the living, which is house majorly, really has hurt the incentives. Even though the government put some incentives, but it's still not enough to, because you have to pay for rent. Uh, give you an example about how, how much it will cost for rent. Like a small efficient in Nansan, which is the science park. Uh, it's like a 20, less than maybe 200 square foot or something. Cost is like uh, 4,000 RMB, which is the half, maybe half of their salary. And that's pretty high for, for ordinary engineers. So they, our, our company has to give sort of the programs, let them choose. If you have a certain degree, after sub subsidy, how much you pay. And uh, so they will calculate, OK, even though I have to pay rent in the first year, for next year, I could get some reimbursement. So that, that's a really bad thing about it, is the cost of living. So this is the half million of the newcomers has high educated. A lot of them has, has the uh, sort of the working experience. So that will cover a little bit about the lack of the university, type of the new talents people. And that's give us uh, enough people. If we have a position opening one day, and then, then next day they, they can fill it up very easy, easily. Uh, still, OK, here's our example of in our company. We have a ma managing, how to manage the executives. And we have 70 executives. 19 of them are from uh, uh, overseas either study or had working experience. Average salary is not low anymore. It's about the 30K RMB per month, which is about 5,000 per month average. And uh, for those Chinese uh, experienced uh, teams, executive teams, advantage for that is they have a very good execution skill and very quick. I'm going to give some example later. And uh, but uh, if it's hard to find the senior position people to do executives. For engineer, engineer is the hard part to attract uh, uh, the people from overseas because same or graduate from the uh, US or stay either in Silicon Valley or <laughs> working somewhere. They don't go back to China too often. And uh, we have about uh, five of them with overseas working experience. And average salary is about 25 RMB per month. And uh, for engineering in China, actually, they're really, if you manage well, they're very productive. <coughs> they really do outstanding work, especially some young talents. And but again, talk about innovation, that's the bad part. Well, anyway, our company did a lot of the good things about how keep those talent people work in the company. And we are, in the past few years, we stood on top of the kind of ranking the company with the lowest employee turnover rate. Uh, example of the fast execution. Uh, we have, a, we trying to, we purchased land in Yancheng, trying to build up a factory facility. And they designed it, everything is like a 20, a 200,000 square, square foot. And we need appliance to finish at that in about one, one and a half years. And before, since we're running business, we don't know anything about the construction. So we kind of outsource this to local construction company to do that. They ended up, the government said, no, that's not a good idea. Because the, the quality and the budget, uh, something is not really guaranteed. It's not by contract, again. Okay. So we hired the one, the someone with the experience how to deal with government, with the construction project. And the, he feel a little different. You know, he used to work in different field, and now he became our manager of this site. Ended up the whole construction from ground 
to moving, start to production, only take one year. And uh, which I was amazed. And this guy, by the way, he like our culture. He chose to stay in the company. He's the deputy general manager for this facility now. And uh, he take a lot of ownership about it. Because as he built up, he has to take care. <laughs> take care of business, too. Another thing is that in the company, in the modem, I think uh, since we're from, uh, we have uh, like a start from the uh, US, so we bring some of the concept from uh, Silicon Valley into the, our new company, I think turned out pretty good. For example, the working environment, we rent a pretty high grade office space. We have about 200 people working at the 4,000 square meter uh, office space. And every summer in the summertime, you know, Shenzhen is kind of the hot. And a lot of companies trying to save the energy gas in our company. We invest uh, uh, some money to replace the old air conditioning. We provide the temperature. I think it's the one or two degree lower than our neighbor. So, <laughs> that, so that makes the employee feel like, oh, we work in the mood and we have a cool place. <laughs> Anyway, that's, I think that's some little things that will, will give them some sort of the advantage. And also, you have to provide like a equity to those employees. And in our company, we have about 100 employees has our equity. So if you have equity in China, Chinese people are very realistic, is that they are, take a lot of ownership from that. So that part, I think we use the 10% of family, uh, company share and to distribute it to the standard people. Uh, the third thing is the strong company culture things, is that uh, we learn something from Google, from Facebook. So, uh, a few years ago, when I visited Google to my daughter, and I went to their uh, dormitory to get some food. And then we went back to China. We said, OK, let's start to provide employees some food. So ended up. Uh, it's a really good decision. I think uh, they compare the company food with the outside food and with the, some other companies food they provided. They're really happy with that. And uh, beside the food and the, and the dessert in the afternoon, we also have sort of the, a lot of activity like sports, uh, which will make us very comfortable. And we have a Tuesday basketball team, have a when, uh, no, Tuesday bad meeting and uh, uh, Thursday basketball, everyday table tennis. I also personally involved with the com competition with them. So I became one, top, one of the top ping pong players. <laughs> I enjoy every minute to play with those youngsters. Also, we developed some personalized career development. Where last year, we hired one guy from this school, from Stanford, and she got a bachelor degree here from uh, uh, bioengineering, and also master degree, worked here for about eight years, and uh, she decided to go back to China. We hired her, but her major was not really fit into us. The reason we hired her is we wanted want her to in charge on the technology development roadmap. And uh, she was not really happy with what, what she's doing, so later, we personalize what career she want to be, want to be engineering, want to be management, and then we do one year plan, two year plan, and across those cultures, and it's now she's really happy, and every day is, is, is energetic. Anyway, every week we have sort of the training program, because our average of our company age is like 20, 27. So a lot of new student, new graduate student, so we have to give them like every week they have a training to learn new stuff. We hire a lot of the instructor outside, inside, to give them training every week. I think that turned out a pretty good productive. Anyway, uh, another part about new training is the resources. Uh, I often heard about the complaint. Do we have time? Okay. Kind of moving, All right. And another thing I uh, often 
hear some new entrepreneur in Shenzhen complaining about their resources. Actually, I, involve, I personally involve a lot of the like, local like, industry association, club, and they have a lot of resources. I just point out the two examples, how you can utilize this resource to take advantage of that. Uh, one example is if you have uh, some product idea, you want to product something, then how to use the local resource. One time I ha have a cup of coffee with my brother, and we think about how, to, how about to build some sort of the device, use the light bulb, has the camera to detect the, what's happened and pr provide the power for that. And then we had the idea, and later on, we ask R&D people to lay out the PCB and the research plans. Then we outsourcing that into the prototype. You know, every week we have a meeting for supplier chain meetings. And we have set quite a few projects that lay on the table. All the suppliers look at this and what they can do, what they cannot do. And in two days, they'll present you with, the, with their prototype machine. And the whole mode, everything, two to three days, cost about 30,000. So this is very fast. At the same time, you know, there's a company called Rain, US company, it's uh, produced a smart doorbell, and they, they start up with the, like a Kickstarter or something, and then they originally they planning to do their product development about one year to deliver to customer. It's ended up about uh, two and a half years for first generations. And because of the ecosystem in Shenzhen, again, like we have a table every week, I have this project, you come to bid, you come to bid, all the suppliers sit there, they say, okay, I can do that one. Then in two days, they're bonding with the prototypes. So that's some advantage if you are in manufacturer section, there's a lot of those things, you should utilize that. Again, uh, production, here we used about four months to get this land produced. And uh, uh, because of supply chain, I'm not going to go more detail about that. Second example I point out here is that if you have some business idea, I want to do something, the incentive, there's a for accelerators and the incubators. There's a lot of them there. They have all kinds of resources, provide you money, provide you engineering, platform. You can, what they call, get in. Once you get in, you link with the business environment there. But they have to take your share. And the success rate for that, after about half a year or one year, then about 5%, I think, uh, will be successful. Once you become successful, again, resource, some good resource, some bad resources. Up to this point, I think it's still a good resource. But when you get in, says you feel so happy about the business you achieved, then you have to be very careful about it, what to do next. Uh, you know, when, the, when our company started about the, uh, uh, four years later, since our, our business number are very attractive, we got this consulting firms, financial advisories, legal advisories come to your office and says, okay, I have an idea for you. What's your exit plan? And uh, it turned out they want to sell your company. And uh, sometimes 80% of those are acquired by those uh, larger public companies. So that's one of the phenomena is that I don't think it's a good phenomena for some of the entrepreneur, but uh, that's called exit plan. So I have to be very careful. The majorly, you have to be very determined what you want in terms of the business development. So this is the, some examples. I point out there's a lot of resource. Another resource, I think, is the, uh, not just for business, uh, even for like, like a legal term. We hire one of the attorney, co-house attorney from uh, US, and the, she, uh, he, he was a single. He joined some local legal uh, club. In about uh, three months, he got married. <laughs> so a lot of the people get together every week. They have their own activities. 
Anyway, I will wrap up with the, some suggestions. And uh, I will start with the, some, for example, here, if you, any one of you want to start up a company, I, from my experience, I'll give you one advice is that if you choose to come to Shenzhen, it's not everything is good to go to Shenzhen. You ask you questions that uh, whether it's a hardware product, is your business idea? If yes, then hardware has a big advantage. If it's just software or service, then I will, you, we can discuss that later. And also, if you have a sort, sort of the industry oriented, you can choose some uh, government subsidy to take some advantage of that. Another thing Chinese government really like is that you have your product, the major market is in China. You know, China became a market and not just a producer. So for success of your business, I think if you have a, uh, your product has market in China, that will make Shenzhen even better. You take more advantage of resources. So this is some question I suggest you ask yourself before you do startups. Another question. This is something, you know, I, I meet with a lot of engineering, as work as the entrepreneur, and the start of the company. They didn't think in what they want. So first three questions I will suggest you ask yourself is what's your exit strategy? Because that's a very important one. I put that in the first, because the often you'll get affected by some other people. They will change your idea of how to do the business. If you, Want to sell your technology? That's great. That's great business model in China. And also sell the product, depends on what business model, or sell the company or you want to set up the brand name. For me, for past like 20 years, my purpose of doing business is trying to build a brand name. And that's a long way to go, and we still call ourselves startups, even this past seven years. Those three questions, actually, a lot of people can change during the running of the business. You can answer that later, but the first question, I think you should, should ask yourself first before you do. Uh, I, I often give some advice for some new people, and uh, when they want to do startups, I said you're not suitable to do with startups, because that's very important. And I witnessed a lot of the examples in my, during my business ventures. I will end up with the Steve Jobs word. Perseverance, that's what you said. The company was successful or not successful. I will end up with the, some high level summary. And then we go with questions. Okay. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. I'm afraid to say that we really don't have time for questions in the formal part of the session. Uh, I'd like to ask maybe the most difficult question, and this will be the only one. So you've grown from being a startup company to competing on a global scale. You've got some really big competitors. How do you stay active and distinctive and keep your mindset to be entrepreneurial from now in the future? Well, uh, that's uh, it's called follow the dream. You know, any sector when you are want to be brand name, especially in two C business model, yeah. especially for consumer electronics, it's always competitive. No matter what you do. Yeah. But uh, we believe that in this new technology drive industry, uh, the unicorn, the future unicorn, yeah. is not going to come from some old companies like uh, Google. Google is an old company, right? Okay, yeah. <laughs> no, I got it. Great. So we Thank want to be so one much. of that. This was great. <laughs> okay. Thank you.